Okay, so the cerebral cortex, what's it made from? Cortical columns, a three-dimensional mosaic of these columnar uh, networks of neurons. Um, now, in unit two, we discussed how information is generated, and we're going to use that um, definition of information that we developed to understand how cortical columns generate information. So let's remind ourselves of what we learned in um, Unit 2. So here we can see um, our two-state system. Um, I think before we had it labelled as state 1 and state 0, but we also said that this could be, you know, heads or tails or plus or minus, or even a yes or no question uh, would be a, a two-state system um, that can generate a single bit of information and that can switch between um, these two states. And when, it, when the system selects one of the states, it thus generates a single unit of information known as a bit. Well, it turns out that we can think of cortical columns in the same way. Now, this is admittedly something of a simplification, um, but it is conceptually correct and it serves our purpose. So we're always going to think about cortical columns either being in an on state or an off state and Indeed, the columns can go from an off state to an on state. You can say they kind of switch on. And they can go from an on state to an off state. So they switch themselves off. And so just like our simple two-state or more generalized two-state system, the cortical column generates information by selecting between one of its two states. Now, of course, a single cortical column can only generate, um, according to this simplified model, a single bit of information. Um, now, there's, of course, absolutely no way that a single cortical column can uh, generate much of uh, your the information that you experience, that's experienced as your uh, subjective world. So how does the brain generate so much information? Uh, well, um, in Unit 2 we also discussed this idea that you can take a large number of simple systems that can only exist in two states uh, to generate systems that can exist in many, many more states and thus can select between a larger number of states, which means that when that system selects one of this very large number of states, it generates a large amount of information. And that is the basic principle by which the brain generates information. So here we can see a pattern of activation of cortical columns. The cort some of the cortical columns are in the off state, such as this one here in the top left, uh, all the grey ones in fact, and all the yellow ones are in the on state. So this is a pattern of cortical column activation. It is one of the possible states of this set of cortical columns. So you can imagine this to be a small very small section of the cortex, a small rectangular section of uh, the cerebral cortex viewed from this bird's eye uh, perspective. Now this is a different state of the cortex, uh, and this is a different state of the cortex. Each state of the cortex is unique, and each state selects from a vast number of possible states and thus generates a vast amount of information. If you're wondering how much information can be generated by all of the cortical columns of the brain, it's around two and a half million gigabits, which is um, 25 with 
15 zeros after it. So it's a very, very large number. Um, and this is the information, this massive amount of information that your cortex can generate by selecting states, by selecting patterns of column activation, um, that is the information that is experienced as your uh, subjective world. Now we also discussed in now we also discussed in unit two that you can constrain the states of a system that contains a number of these um, single bit information generating units by forming connections between them. Um, so we use this simple example. We've got two of these systems, S1 and S2. Um, and by connecting them, in other words, by assuming that when S1 is active, it causes S2 to be active, or sorry, when S1 is blue, it causes S2 to be blue, uh, and when S2 is blue, it causes S1 to be blue, uh, and the same with the yellow state. So when S1 is in the yellow state, it causes S2 to be in the yellow state, and vice versa, when S2 is in the yellow state, it causes S1 to be in the yellow state. So this constrains the number of states of this system, which means that the blue-yellow state, or indeed the yellow-blue state, uh, are not possible. And this means that um, the system can essentially constrain or sculpt uh, its states. And the Cortex actually does uh, a similar thing. So rather than this generalized um, two systems, our blue and yellow systems, um, we will apply this to the cortex. So what that means is that, for example, um, let's take, um, it's easier to start with state two. We can imagine that this column, so we'll label these columns actually, let's label them column one and column two, and we'll do the same here, hmm, that's a bad idea, column one and column two. Now it's not difficult to imagine that when column one is active, that it can have an influence on column two, um, i.e. that column one, when it becomes active, actually activates column two, or equivalently, when column one is on, it causes column two to switch on, and vice versa. When column two switches on, it causes column one to switch on. So that means um, that the so C one on, C two off um, is impossible in this case because whenever C one switches on, it's going to switch on uh, column two. So that's not possible, and vice versa. So when C2 switches on, it's going to switch on um, column one. So it means that the on off um, state is also not possible. So we can discount those. But of course, the this state one here, this overall off state, is possible because neither C1 nor C2 is switching on the other. So what we've done, just as with the, the more generalized uh, example, is that we've, we've sculpted the number of states. We've reduced the number of states of this two-column system from four uh, to two. And more generally, this is what the brain does um, to sculpt the possible patterns of activation. So let's look at this um, slice uh, this little piece of the cortex, again, another rectangular piece of the cortex. Uh, and you can see the columns as before, um, nothing new there. The only difference is now you can see connections between them. Um, so, for example, you can see a connection between 
this column in the top left and this one uh, to the lower right. But there isn't a connection between this top left one, and, or direct connection anyway, uh, and, and this one. So, so what that means is that when a column switches on, it can influence the columns to which it is connected. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean and, uh, that when a column is switched on, it's automatically going to switch on every column to which it is connected. Um, that is because as well as these what are called excitatory connections, which you actually you know what an excitatory connection is now, um, there are also inhibitory connections between these columns. So we'll look at the, uh, in a little bit more detail, the way that these columns are connected uh, later on in the course. And it won't be, I think, until maybe unit six or seven where we actually uh, look at the structure of these columns in, in more detail and actually consider how they are connected. But just as a kind of a heads up, you already understand how these connections work. So you already understand the, uh, the chemical synapse. And surprise, surprise, the chemical synapse is um, how these um, cortical columns are connected. And in fact, there are very large numbers of connections between each column. Um, and these are not always, um, they are not by any stretch, all excitatory connections. Remember, an excitatory connection between two neurons across a synapse is when the presynaptic neuron releases an excitatory neurotransmitter. We looked at glutamate and causes an, an excitatory uh, postsynaptic potential in the postsynaptic neuron, which brings it closer to threshold, makes it more likely to fire. Um, whereas an inhibitory uh, connection is when the presynaptic neuron releases an inhibitory neurotransmitter. We looked spe specifically at GABA, uh, which causes an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, an IPSP, in the postsynaptic cell. Uh, and so, as you'd expect, because each column is constructed from very large numbers of neurons, there are many um, excitatory and many in inhibitory connections within the column itself, and that also applies to the connections uh, between the columns. Um, but put that out of your mind uh, for the moment. At the moment, just think of these columns uh, as these simplified on-off structures that are connected, and that these connections mean that uh, one column can have an influence on uh, a column to which it is connected. Now, that might be an excitatory connection overall. It might mean that one column tends to switch on another column. But it also might mean that when a column is um, switched on, it actually inhibits and makes it less likely that another column will switch on. Now, I guess I should um, also define what I mean by switched on. Um, that, it, it's, a, it's a tricky concept. Um, but later on, in, in later units, we'll, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about what I mean by that. But basically, when a column is active, when certain sets of neurons within the cortical column are kind of firing, um, then we say that the, the cortical column is switched on. Uh, whereas when they are kind of resting and quiet, we say it is switched off. Um, but the, the take home point here is that a, a column can, can be either on or it can be off and that it can influence the columns to which it is connected. And by sculpting these connections, as we will see, uh, the brain is actually able to sculpt the, the pattern of column activation uh, and, and therefore the, the pattern of information uh, that the brain is actually generating and that manifests as your subjective world. All right.